what, what is ego actually? Actually, ego is a protector. It protects yourself. And it's always rooted in fear. Even high ego, on, on the surface, they look very confident or even arrogant. But underneath, it's fear. So the awareness of ego, I think that is the most important. A uh, bit intro about Dennis. So I want to start. How I get to know Dennis is that, uh, you know, during the pandemic uh, 2022, we both signed up to a class, Search Inside Yourself, by our trainer, uh, Kathleen and Xiao Yao, remember? And then we had a great time there. And one thing that I remember, Dennis, uh, you mentioned about you wanted to be the sunshine of other people. Right? So that is what uh, catch me and make me feel like I should get connected to you and you as a person who are very cheerful in that, in that class. I still remember that. This is how we get together back, get connected in 2022. So Dennis Ackerman is the visionary founder of Orbis Business School. So the, the same color you look at this, <laughs> red. If you saw a red circle, it's the Orbit Business School, as well as a distinguished transformational coach, consultant, and captivating speakers on global stage, spending more than 30 countries. He is born and bred in the Netherlands. He lived in five different countries and feeling at home in Malaysia for more than 11 years in KL right now. Dennis was inspired to write his book, The Naked Leader, as the what that I have in my hand here. Uh, Leadership Trilogy Part 1. What do you mean Part 1? More to come. <laughs> By his own life-changing transformational journey, after two decades in corporate leadership role, he hit rock bottom after a roller coaster of life events. His first startup company failed. His first marriage failed. He ran out of money, and shortly afterward, his only sister suddenly passed away. All of which was happened around the same time. He felt lost and didn't want to do any more personal, personally and professionally. In that dark corner, he had a profound insight that changes his outlook on life and business. The, na the Naked Leaders in this book provide a compact yet insightful guide to set you for bigger and more meaningful outcomes in life and in business. The book is full of eternal wisdom and thought-provoking questions that help you gain a deeper understanding of your thought pattern and behaviors. Dennis shares seven powerful steps to effectively change your mindset and ultimately becoming the best version of yourself, your naked self. So in this podcast session that we're going to have, I'm going to ask Dennis uh, questions that I personally interested on. And I hope that it could, I believe that it could bring some value to all of you and also for myself as well. All right. And personally, after reading the book, I felt it, it is among one of the more comprehensive leadership books, apart from this John C. Maxwell kind of people. And it's very simple, very simplified and easy to understand. Right. Thanks for writing out the book. <laughs> <laughs> right, Dennis. Okay, uh, Dennis, probably to start, I wanted to, uh, you, you shared some story in your book that I personally interested in and I would like to know more. If you could tell a bit more about your childhood, how were you raised, what did the environment foster in terms of thinking in, your, in yourself, in the framework uh, for understanding the world? Would you share that uh, with us? Is, yeah. Sure, Billy. Yes, first of all, uh, thank you, Billy, and everyone at Intel for this great opportunity. Uh, happy to be in Penang. Also, hello to all the online participants. 
Um, yeah, I'm happy to share uh, about my book and um, our life journey starts with our childhood and that defines a good part of the rest of your life, I would say. Um, so my childhood was um, a bit complicated, a bit challenging in the sense that um, my sister had mental health issues and my parents were basically totally occupied with uh, her life. Um, I'm the older one in the family, I only have one sibling, um, Miriam, and uh, that was all the attention uh, went to her. So I was in that sense a bit lost because if you ask me how I was I raised, well actually I raised myself to, to a large extent. Mm. And for a long time I blamed my parents for that and actually everyone blames the parents for something, right? Um, and I think well, the way I see it now is that they, they, it's not that they don't love me and they don't care for me, it's more that they did, simply did not have the mind space or energy to uh, look after myself. But if you transform that thought process, well, first of all, you need to forgive your parents because parents are also human beings. They also have their own flaws like every human being. So I think whatever grudges we hold to our parents, mm. I think is a negative energy. So we need to forgive them first and foremost. But in order to do that, I also thought I need to transform the way I look back at my childhood is it also was a great opportunity for me to become um, independent and responsible. So that also led me to my uh, management and leadership career because I had to look at my, after myself uh, at a very young age. So I, they were not there but to answer the questions that I had. They were not there to cook a meal. All these things raised me from a young age uh, to, uh, yeah, to look after myself. And I think, hey, that was the reason that I was promoted into a management position at a relatively young age. Uh, because I, I felt responsible for the work that I did. I felt responsible for the team. Mm. Uh, so I think it's also a blessing in disguise. Uh, mm. So that's uh, part of my childhood. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Denise. And uh, those kind of um, tough, challenging bring up and uh, the isolation that you have uh, from your parents have built up you to be, um, I think, like more for forgiveness like, like to, to your parents, is it, is it happens lately or is it, is it like throughout your young, you, what is that, is it the same feelings you have? Just curious. Though that changed, all, uh, I think for many years I all, uh, held these crutches to be honest. Uh, I think, you know, why you were not there uh, when I needed you. Uh, mm -hmm. that you don't really explicitly say it in that way, but you feel that way. Uh, and later stage in life, of course, I, I spent, had to spend more time with them and all those things. But also the fact that I live far away is also a kind of um, disconnect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 10,000 kilometers away. Luckily, they are still alive. Uh, they are now in their mid-70s. Yeah. Um, but every time I visit them, uh, it's really quality time. I really appreciate the time that I have with them uh, right now. Uh, so it, it took me, let's say, half of my lifetime to get to that insight and understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I bring you to the next question, Dennis, is that um, what is the, in your book, there is each of the chapter, there have at least five or ten questions there. So, what is the questions or questions that you mentioned in the book that has most impacted you and why? Yeah, there's only one question that stands out and that's actually the entire uh, first chapter and that question is, who am I? Hmm. Uh, and I wish for everyone to ask that question. And who am I is not defined by your titles and roles and labels. Yeah, who am I? I can say, okay, I'm the managing director. I'm a father. Uh, I'm a marathon runner. That are all labels, right? That are external labels to easily identify yourself with other people. You hand over your business card. That's also a, a label. Mm. But who are you really on a deeper level? Or who do you want to be? Those questions and many leadership books, I also a bookworm in that sense, I uh, read about it. They do not really ask these questions and you have these online uh, questionnaires and surveys uh, and sometimes you have this leadership assessment when you apply for new jobs, but they only focus on the observable behavior, but they don't really focus on who are you, what is your purpose in life, uh, what is your unique quality and all these things. And I try to ask 
that question with a follow-up question. So in the book, you won't find all these answers because every answer is unique for every individual. But I ask these questions because if you ask surface questions, you get surface answers. But if you ask yourself deeper questions, you also get uh, more profound answers. And that is very liberating. If you're willing to look at yourself in the mirror like that, uh, I think that is, uh, yeah, a lot of stress and pressure is gone by only doing this, uh, this process. Yeah. So, who am I is a great question. And would you share like, who are you in the standpoint and how do you reach to that who are you? That's also a journey. So it's not that uh, on a Monday morning you wake up and then I think, okay, I am Dennis. That's my name and et cetera, et cetera. It is a, it is a process of uh, discovery. It's also a process of unlearning. Uh, because especially in the corporate world, uh, there's a lot of pretending. Um, of course, we want to look good to our bosses. We want to achieve the KPIs, usually set by other people. All of these things, the, the environment has so much influence on you, and you need to look through these things to really get to that uh, answers. And the only way to do that is to step out of that uh, zone. And uh, I purposely and literally stepped out of that. Uh, so I went offline for 10, 10 days. No, no internet, no phone, also no talking, which is good for me. Uh, and then you are with yourself. And you will observe all your thought uh, patterns. The first few days, you, talk, uh, you think a lot about all the daily things, like, uh, OK, oh. Did I really forgot to switch off the light when I left the house? That kind of things. But after a few days, you, you, can, you, you get over that. And there's no escaping anymore. There's no hiding anymore. That mirror is right in front of you. And you're, you're on your own. And that's where you actually can discover uh, who you really are. Now, to summarize who am I then, um, is also uh, this book is, is part of that. This book already existed for, for quite some time. It just had. I needed the opportunity to write it down and get it out to the world. Uh, mm. But that is very close to my, my, my purpose, is to share this and to help other people also uh, finding their way in uh, life. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, Dennis, when I read your book, I felt it is simple, comprehensive. I was thinking about the concept of like a lossless compression. You still have meaning inside. However, it is fairly straightforward. And uh, to ask the next question, Dennis, is that uh, would you share what is Naked Leader? All right. Naked Leader, I, I, usually I start with a disclaimer because some people are extremely disappointed after the session. <laughs> they have an expectation that uh, being naked, is, I'm not going to take off my clothes, that kind of things. Sorry about that. Uh, I think it would definitely go viral if I would do that on social media. But, uh, <laughs> Also land me in trouble in, uh, in this country, I guess. So uh, I won't do that. Now, what is the real nakedness? Well, if you know the emperor's clothes tale, an ancient tale is that everybody knows the emperor is naked except the, na the emperor himself. Well, I think that sums up pretty much what the naked leader, but that's your most authentic self. So your stress is affecting your thought process. It's narrowing your brain. Um, your ego also stands in the way big time. And ego can go two ways. Uh, you can have a low ego, you can have a high ego, but in both cases, it's, uh, it's not who you are. Uh, your past is also, the, and your environment, they all have influences on you, but it's also not who you are. So the naked leader is, I think, a person who has found the most accurate view of themselves. Yeah? So that's not about being arrogant or being too shy or humble about it. It's the reality, the real you, yeah? that's one thing. Um, and also, if you have that insight, you also know what is your influence on other people. Because I, ha I coach a lot of leaders and they, they complain about pretty much everything, especially their staff. Yeah, my staff is useless, uh, and why are they leaving? And uh, they don't perform, they are not motivated, uh, and all that. They're complaining about the staff. But I, I usually say, maybe not nice to hear this, but leaders, if you complain about your staff, you're actually complaining about yourself because you are the one who is in charge. Yeah. You are the one, it's an energy exchange as well. Uh, you are the one who can make changes in the team. 
you, you have so much influence as a leader. So if you complain about, I mean, not about individual performance cases that you can have in your team. I mean, I also have, you can, you can create a real great drama series on Netflix for all the things that I've uh, been through with my teams. That's all the individual cases where you need to uh, handle as a leader. But if you complain about all your stuff all the time and they are useless, then I think, okay, what is your part in, in that uh, dynamic? Yeah? What is your contribution to that situation to happen? And I also believe in a kind of, let's call it business karma. Yeah? How you treat employees is also how employees treat you back. How you treat your customers is also how customers will value you. How you treat money is also how money comes back to you. Mm. So that is the exchange that I was talking about. Now, if you're not aware of uh, your, yourself, um, then you also don't know what is the impact on other people. Let me give you one small example. When I just started in my corporate career, I was really a, a smart ass, okay? I wanted to prove myself, I know this all, and I was in my early 20s, ambitious, and I thought I knew the world already. I come in as a young guy in a corporate world. In meetings, I was also interrupting people, I already know this, and I want to project my knowledge, and um, I come from a technology background as well, so knowledge is power, right? And I also talk a lot, and if other people uh, say something, I barely listen to them because I thought, yeah, halfway the sense, I already know this. And then I'd, I also discover for myself that actually this is pretty annoying for other people. But other people won't tell you this. That's the problem in uh, not only corporate, but you see that in families and also friends. What is a true friend? Mm. Is a true friend somebody who tells you what you want to hear or what you need to hear? Think about that. I prefer the latter. Dennis, this was not a great idea. Dennis, maybe you should think about this a little bit longer. I appreciate these friends. I don't, I'm not offended by that anymore. In the past, I was. I think, yeah, come on. Uh, what, what are you, you feel very uh, defensive, things like that. But I appreciate that nakedness also in friendships because um, if, you, if you're blind in that spot, you need somebody else to shine the light on that. Only then you can improve. Only then you can surround yourself with people who are better than you in these blind spots. So if you are a leader, you, you, you are not the best guy in the room or the best uh, girl in the room. You surround yourself with people who are better than you, mm. uh, especially in technology. Uh, when I talk to technology leaders, if you know more about AI than your team, why are you not an AI specialist? Why are you the leader? And technology becomes so complex that if you lead a team of 20 people, do you really think that your single brain knows more than these 20 brains combined? Mm. I don't think so, right? So. You, you are a facilitator in that sense. You are not a know-it-all. Uh, that's why I think we have to move away from that situation that a leader always has to have all the answers. Mm. So that was also my own learning when I just jumped into the corporate world. I was that know-it-all mm. kind of person. That doesn't work. But uh, I've had to bump my head a few times before I finally figured that out myself because nobody told me. Everybody was annoyed by me, but nobody told me this. Mm. That is, I was really surprised. You want to ask a question first? The corporate world usually the leaders are the one to say, like, there's some way they want to shape certain teams. Uh, so they're not to be, for say, mass majority of them wants to, they're not to be too directly and honest on their answers. They just want to like, paint a like, picture, very optimistic pictures, and I think that's the corporate world. But how do you survive that with your thinking that you have to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, being authentic does not mean that we always have to um, share everything. That's one thing. There are things that um, should not be shared uh, with everyone. And being vulnerable also doesn't mean uh, being weak. Um, but what we learned, especially also during COVID, I guess, is that nobody knew uh, when the MCO would end it or when the new MCO would kick in. So if you tell people like, yeah, we will get through this and no problem and uh, next week things will be different, you can't make that statement because you don't know. We, nobody knows, right? So uh, another one is completely denial. Well, in COVID, there's no way around it. MCO affected this, uh, so you can't deny that fact. 
So what is then the middle way? The middle way for me is admitting to your team that, yes, we don't know when this MCO is going to end, mm. but how can we get through this together? What are the things that we can do together as a team uh, so not just the captain, but the whole team when the ship is sinking and make sure that the ship stays afloat and uh, gets safely into the harbor. That is the type of motivation and honesty uh, that you give to people because otherwise if you promise the MCO will end, you can't ma make that promise. Um, if you deny there is an MCO, then people will also find out that is not, not the case. right? Um, and another one is okay, managing your bosses, uh, that's also about performance, impact, and exposure. I work with certain leaders who are great in selling themselves, but they don't really deliver anything meaningful. They are just great presenters. On the other hand, usually on technology people, they are great performers, they know a lot and um, massive results, but they don't share that with other people. I think both of them are not good. If you work hard, it's not sufficient. You also need to share your successes in the right way. But if you only boast about things that actually have no substance, sooner or later people also find out that it's not that authentic. Uh, but I, I really can't stand those leaders who have the greatest presentations, but what actually have they done now? What have mm. they delivered? So that is where I think um, it's, that's the rules of the game in the corporate world is no master degree will prepare you for that. You need to figure that out, uh, how, to, how to play the game well. Okay. But uh, that's what I mean with honesty, is that uh, don't be on these two extremes, denial or uh, over-promising. It's mm. in the middle. If that answers your sole question. Good question. Yeah. So that is that when you mentioned about what uh, Xiong mentioned, when you say that in your book you mentioned about why not 10x your goal, mm -hmm. Why not to have a great goal setting? So if you had, if, if we are a leader, how can we rally the whole team towards the 10x goal that we have in mind? Yeah, that doesn't start with uh, telling people the goals. Uh, that starts with the entire motivation of the team anyway. So if you're an inspiring leader, you you're don't wait till the annual uh, performance uh, appraisals and okay, what are your new targets and just let's make it 10 times. The, pr the, the problem with goals is that most goals are actually not ambitious enough. That sounds a bit weird because we have a high pressure environments, we use a lot of stress. But usually they are an extrapolation of the past. Salespeople, for example. Salespeople, if they hit their target, great, they get a bonus. What happens with the next year target? Goes up. Goes up with <laughs> a certain percentage, right? Yeah. What if they don't uh, meet the target? Yeah. Either no bonus or out, yeah? Mm. So that's a funny thing, there was some research about this, is that no matter what target you set for the salespeople, they more or less hit that target or just don't hit it, yeah? There are maybe some bad performers who are totally uh, not in sales and they don't hit, uh, hit any target, but Averagely, if you look at the statistics, more or less around that benchmark. If you increase that to another level in different situations, more or less people. So that's the mindset that comes in first. So if you do 10 times a goal, 10x, I'm not saying it has to be exactly 10x, yeah. but your thought process will be totally different. I even go further in certain workshops and say, okay, what if this is unlimited? What if you have unlimited amount of time? Mm. What would you do? What, what if you have unlimited amount of money? What would you do? Then turn it around. What if you have no time? What if you have no money? What would you do? And the reason why we do this kind of exercise is because it takes you out of your standard thinking. Your standard thinking is usually based on your last year's targets and we just have to do a little bit better than that. If you just tear the, all these papers apart, just assume you don't know anything what happened in the past and then you will think about this. Unlimited versus nothing. You get a totally different result. And that's all about mindset. It's not whether you can achieve it, but it's about the mindset. That is when you did that 
experiment to the participant? What was the outcome? Do you share? Well, for me, this is uh, a very powerful exercise for innovation, um, where uh, people really come up with much, much better ideas than you can ever hope for. It's a very creative process, actually. Mm. So, would it be always be a better one, or sometimes we stumble upon like a lousy one? I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's really, I say, it's really no direction, right? Yeah, it has to be open. Why? Because. Um, Initially, things that might look lousy in the end might make the most sense. So what is very important in this process is that as a leader, we will not, let's say, judge or comment on these ideas initially. Um, when I run these workshops with teams, I also ask themselves to prioritize and group these ideas together. And we do this kind of uh, whiteboard sessions with post-its, OK? So let them evaluate their own ideas that, that is uh, one thing, because sometimes ridiculous ideas might shift uh, the, the thinking of the other people as well. Mm. So ridiculous thinking, I think, should be encouraged in that sense. OK. Yeah. So uh, the, the next I would like to ask more into your book, right? So yeah. you mentioned about human has many weaknesses and strength. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to gain clarity and cultivate growth in the right area in particular of weakness or strength? OK, what is the most important for me is to increase your awareness. And awareness, you can also translate it as consciousness or mind space. And essentially, and where it starts is to get out of your stress zone. Because stress literally, as mentioned before, is l narrowing your brain. Um, it is a survival. And in the old days, when we have all these dangerous animals uh, running after us, it was useful because you only focus on one thing, get away from these big animals as, as soon as you can. Uh, mm. So our bodies are still responding in that way. But in an office environment, we don't have life-threatening situations most of the time, unless the, the house is on fire. So in that sense, stress is not a very conducive state of being yeah. in, in, in a work environment. But what is more important is that survival brings you more to the I, to yourself, to the ego. Uh, look, look at mountaineers, eh, for um, the, the ones who go into the Himalayas, eh, the Everest climbing. They are in a survival mode, and they can't even think of the other. They don't have time or the mind space to think of the other climbers there, even though it's a team effort to go uh, to the summit. Um, but that is what stress really literally does with your brain. So if you're always in a stress mode, I, you, you will take le you have less insights in what's happening around you, more so your team. So the first step for me in the awareness level is to get out of the stress zone. Now, how can you get out of, out of the stress zone? There are different ways of doing that, depending on your pers personal, personal preferences. So meditation can be one. Uh, yoga can be another one. Uh, other people like to do uh, physical sports, because most of the time we are here. Yeah? We need to get out of our heads. So uh, physical activity, uh, I also spoke about this with my wife. Said, yeah, actually, I also like to learn Mandarin and uh, uh, play chess and that kind of thing. But I think, again, I'm, I'm, you know, my whole day is already filled with, with this, this organ here. right? So I like to do a bit more physical activities to, to balance that. And it can also break down your stress level. So whatever you do, whatever you prefer, but make sure that you spend time. That's also what I meant in the book is um, space creates space. So I don't believe in people who are boasting in, uh, oh, I work um, uh, 80 hours a week, and I only sleep three hours. Uh, and I, I think Elon Musk is a famous example. Mm. He's, he's really borrowing from, from the future in terms of his energy. I don't, don't think that is a sustainable. Right? So you need to set time aside. I did it hardcore with 10 days to retreats. I'm not saying that everybody has to do that. But that is really not only recharging your batteries. It, it's really giving you all the insights that you need. So awareness. The more awareness you have, the, the better results you will have. So Dennis, you touched some interesting point. It reflect back to me. And in your book, you touch a bit on ego. Mm -hmm. right? I was really excited 
a bit of a uh, question myself. You mentioned about low ego and high ego. I actually spot some of your, say, your examples of what high ego and, and low ego is. And I guess that what is, I want to understand for you, what is your take on the ego part? And is it the balance is the answer or is it the, which, what is the answer that a leader should, should have or should be? Yeah, probably a bit uh, special. Yeah, well, we can't get rid of ego. Um, what, what is ego actually? Actually, ego is a protector. It protects yourself. And it's always rooted in fear. Even high ego, on, on the surface, they look very confident or even arrogant. But underneath, it's fear. So the awareness of ego, I think that is the most important. But how could do we become aware of it? I think it becomes a bit of a recurring answer from my side yeah. is, of course, to increase your awareness. So you can't get rid of your ego, but you can balance it. Um, low ego, on the other hand, is um, the difference between um, humility and low, low esteem. Mm. Yeah. So low esteem is a low ego. Yeah, that's actually. You, you, you sell yourself short. Humility, I think, is a, is a great quality. That's not ego. Yeah, that, that is just uh, avoiding bragging, let's put it that way. High ego, on the other hand, is the same. There's nothing wrong with being confident. Yeah? But being arrogant, that is already a biased view of yourself, yeah, that mm. you are the best in the world and, and nobody uh, can tell you anything. So the balance is, is, is in between. And in my book, I also share some ways to balance your ego. And that also makes your life a lot easier. So am, am I right, Dennis, the key point I catch here is that, like for example, if I am confident or say I'm arrogant, mm -hmm. but behind the arrogant, I have no fear, means that I have the right arrogant. Am I right? That's, that's, that's good. In my view, arrogance is always underpinning a fear. And that is the fear of looking weak, being embarrassed, uh, don't have the answers, that's arrogance. Or that you're more than uh, somebody else. Mm. And a low ego is that you think that you're lesser than somebody else. OK. All right. So I want to go to the uh, next question. So I just read a uh, quote from your book, mm -hmm. if you mind. So this is a quote from the page 79. Uh, it says that uh, in the title of letting go of the past, mm -hmm. so you mentioned about holding on grudges, regrets, and mistakes is a negative energy and keeps yourself stuck in the past. Even positive emotion attached can create unhappiness. You wish the good old time to come back and remain forever. So would you share with us what is your experience on this and how I can too not hold into the positive emotion forever? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the thing is, um, the best example to explain this, the feeling you have after a great holiday, you go back to work. Most of people are dreading that first day, right? You had an amazing holiday to whatever destination. Uh, finally time to relax a bit with your family and then the first working day. If you love your work, you might look forward to it, but still the holiday is over. Mm. Right? So that is a bit of the feeling is if you hold on to that, I'm not saying that you have to forget about your holiday. Okay. What I'm saying is that you can't have a holiday forever. Actually, you also see that with people who lost, lose a job. Yeah? If you work hard and you have limited annual leave, you appreciate this holiday mm. and these few days off. If you lose your job and you, you are idle for half a year at home, do you really think you will still appreciate mm. that time off? You don't feel that, wow, I have all the time of the, the day. You become lazy, you sleep in the morning, and you have not really a sense of purpose. So that is two sides of the same coin, I would say. Now, how to deal with these things. I think in business, we also have to be careful on these good times. When business is good, and also 
say for rainy days is another one. If business is good, we also tend to spend more, we really enjoy, we have massive profit, everybody get the best bonus, everybody happy. But are you prepared then for different times? Are you prepared for a downturn? And look at these examples, eh? Nokia and, and Kodak, for example. They were riding on a massive success. Eh? The Nokia phones, uh, I grew up in that uh, time, that was that was really cool uh, until Apple uh, came, came along. So also that is a kind of a blindness. You hold on to your successes. So you can appreciate your successes, but don't expect it will last forever. I think that's an important lesson for business, but also for yourself. Uh, anytime you can lose your job, and I also um, had these things in, in short time frame, like I mentioned, these life events. Actually, I lost pretty much everything in my life in in a very short time frame. And then I think, OK, uh, that really puts you, uh, it's, it's a hard place. And you also long back to the good times, but you have to learn to move on. Mm. If you're hanging, oh, especially when I started my first business and uh, no money was coming in. Um, and I came out of this golden cage. I was an expatriate here in, um, in Malaysia for three years. I worked for Dutch Lady, and that was really Best job in the world, great package, nearly seven figures in ring it and all that, you know, business class travel all the time. Then I started my business, I had a PA, great, yeah. I didn't even need to think, as you always booked the ILC for me and things like that, right? You can say, spoiled, yeah. Then I started my own business, okay. Well, that's really hands on. Uh, there's nobody else, I had no staff and no income. How many times I wish to have that paycheck? Yeah. Every end of the month, the 25th was the payday, <laughs> not coming, nothing coming. So you hold on to these good times. But that's, that's not a productive energy at all. Mm. Because actually it was my own decision to start that business, right? I have to face that. So that this longing back to the old days is actually also a fear response. You're so fearful, what if this business is not going to make money? Stupid me, I made the wrong decision. I should have stayed in, a, in this company, right? So it's all about fear. Your fear will drag you back into that. Um, then I have to go back to my home country, I have to find a job uh, and all those things. It's all driven by fear. Fear is never a good advisor. It's the worst consultant in the world. If you make your decisions based on fear, that I think there are only a few decisions that I made based on fear, that's when you need to be on a high alert situation. Yeah? If you work on an oil rig uh, where safety is at stake or in a hospital or airlines, fear must be converted to certainty there. Yeah? There must be compliance and there must be SOPs, fine. But for the rest, most things in our life, decisions made of fear are usually the worst decision. Correct. Yeah. And Dennis, I think from what you say that something reflected me that if anything that we wish we want, that we want to desire that we want, we look at it, if what we want is why not we move back to our old job and my stupid me, right? So we focus on that and then we will get that. It brings me up to the concept of law of attraction, right? So this is something that I'm personally yeah. interested about. Like, I also want to see that uh, from what I get to you, if you wanted to do anything, we need to focus on something that brings us pleasure, brings us good feelings, right? So would you share with us like what in the spirit of law of attraction, what is your uh, what what is your thought on that or law of attraction? Uh, what is that to you? And then what is your success story to share? Great. Yeah, first to bridge the previous topic with law of attraction. So what I mentioned is the uh, holding on to the past and the great the times that you had, that's based on fear. Okay, and why is that? Because you only look at the pain. Yeah? The pain equation, well, it's an equation. So you look at the pain only. Yeah. Why I wrote Nate Leader especially is, what is the gain? That is your purpose. Your business purpose, your life purpose, whatever it is. Once you see your purpose, that is the gain. And everybody wants to win the gold medal in Olympics. But who wants to go through the pain uh, of all the trading effort that you have to put in to get to the gold medal? You need to have that equation, pain versus gain. If you don't know your gain, you only look at the pain. Mm. Yeah? 
So once you know your game, example of Elon Musk, yeah, he knows his purpose of SpaceX. Every decision he makes becomes a lot easier. And he is ruthless in this. All the engineers, does this bring us closer to Mars? Yes or no? If the answer is no, don't waste my time. That sounds harsh, but that's the clarity of purpose. The purpose is build a colony on Mars. Right? So when you know your purpose or your business purpose, that becomes a lot easier. And it's also giving a lot of positive energy and momentum towards that goal because he has a clarity. He is so clear, clear and ruthless about it. He does not want to entertain people who are standing in his way to get that goal. Mm. Well, apart from certain leadership traits that he uh, employs, we can talk about it another time, but the clarity of purpose makes him so successful because he is willing to go through a lot of pain. Even employees are willing to go through a lot of pain because they contribute to that mission. If you're a rocket engineer, how great it is to work on this project to go to Mars. You are part of that project. And I spoke with a uh, son of a NASA engineer who, brought, uh, who built this Apollo rocket to, to the moon. When John F. Kennedy announced that in the early 60s, they had no clue how to get to the moon. No clue at all. They did manual calculations, and if they were wrong, they would either be in space forever or crash into the moon. But that mission, that inspirational talk that uh, John F. Kennedy, unfortunately, was assassinated before they got to the moon, but that's the law of attraction, right? That purpose, that mission came through before the end of the decade, in 1969, they went to the moon. So the gain equation, that's the insight that you need. Yeah? Then you got there. Now then on the law of attraction, once you have that insight and you have that purpose, um, and I studied Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, and a lot of those uh, visionary leaders, um, this law of attraction already worked for him, for him for, uh, since childhood. He was looking at uh, Star Trek and, uh, and all these things. Um, he visualized that. And a lot of people think, yeah, you're crazy, uh, go to Mars. If you ask for an investment that time, before you even build one rocket, who's going to invest $200 billion in that project? Everybody think you're insane, right? So that's, uh, that's about the gain part. Now, law of attraction, how do we apply that? Most people say, oh, I, I, oh, I wish to win the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> that's not how the law of attraction works. Yeah. That, that purpose is something that is you, that is inside you. That is an, that's not even a belief, that is, an, that is a knowing, it's a conviction. Mm. That goes really deep. So winning the lottery or you want to fly yeah, as a human, that's not going to work. Yeah? That's not going to work. What I've done, I applied the law of attraction already before I study all of these things in the literature and all that. Um, so when I was the smart ass in my early career, I walked past the boardroom uh, where the, the management meetings were held, and I visualized myself in that, in that boardroom. And I was too much of a smartest to think, why am I not sitting there? That was my thought process at that moment. OK, mm -hmm. that, that was the arrogant side of me. But the law of attraction was really, I want to sit there. Um, I feel I can be a leader. I want to be part of the management team. Mm -hmm. And then not long after, um, that happened. And it's not just once, uh, it's a few times uh, more in my life where this happened. Um, so I started working without any degrees that time, uh, also because of the situation in my family, and um, I, I did not study. So I just started on a call center at that moment, right? Picking up the phone for customers. So for my, for my bachelor degree and later on my MBA degree, I had the same visualization. It's almost like a vivid dream. So visualization is very important for uh, manifestation of the law of attraction. So knowing your purpose, uh, visualization, um, really feel that you're almost there. And the great thing about law of attraction is like movies, your brain cannot distinguish between what you imagine and what is real. If you watch a movie, yeah. A movie is just a screen. Yeah? It's, if it's Netflix, it's just something streaming from the internet, yeah? ones and zeros, bytes. We, we know that rationally. But why do we get emotional from uh, movies? It's the same thing. Your brain does not extinguish. If you go into the horror movie, the fear that you, the horror movie is fake, but the feelings you have is real, right? So the law of attraction is the same thing. You need to feel as if you're already there. Mm. And top sport people apply these same things. They don't visualize, uh, they don't work too much on their failures. They visualize the success. And uh, I spoke with one of the uh, Olympic speed skaters from the Netherlands. He, 
He knows exactly all the strokes on the ice rink, the 400 meter uh, loop. He, he knows exactly, he can completely, if you wake him up in the middle of the night, he can, he can skate his golden race already by that. That's how focused they are on mm. uh, achieving the goal. So that is, I think, yeah. how you do that. Yeah. That is it. The key point that I, I got from here is that <clears throat> law of attraction equals to getting more gain when you reach the destination. Am I right? Yeah. So because in your book, you mentioned about two, two things that are, one is that how can we exponential grow our gain so that we wanted to move and also how can we reduce what we have right now so that uh, it's also motivation for us not to stay. Right. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 a bit different throughout the tangent, a bit different. Uh, what are your chaos or stress management techniques uh, that you would advise or you apply for yourself? Well, chaos is not necessarily a negative thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but stress management techniques is uh, essential. So in the book, I also write about uh, practical uh, tips to do these things. Uh, for me, meditation works. I'm mm. an avid meditator since 2007. Uh, and for meditation, is, it is, the mind is a muscle. Yeah, it needs to be trained. So yes, I went through these 10-day uh, retreats and things like that. But if you do that once in five years, not too much of a benefit. So if you practice that every day, uh, even five minutes, that's over time, you will see the benefits. And people, and this is the era of instant gratification. That's not how meditation works. Uh, meditation is a long-term journey. It's a marathon rather than a sprint. Uh, and people say, yeah, but I don't have time to meditate. Uh, mm. I don't have time for these uh, 10 minutes. Well, um, there was a famous um, guru who said, well, if you don't have uh, 10 minutes for meditation per day, then uh, you have to meditate for 20 minutes per day. Uh, well, and I love that quote because who has no uh, 10 minutes a day? Mm. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, so there are different techniques. Uh, meditation is one of them that works really well for me. Uh, and um, it gives you a lot of clarity, uh, great ideas, um, connect back to that purpose. If when things are difficult or not going in the direction that you uh, wish, uh, that, that is your anchor that you can get back to. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then, and then I, think, I think to emphasize the gain, there's one thing that I learned also that uh, they say when you can man meditate and visualize, actually the 10 minutes that you put in, probably you get back 3x of your productivity, Absolutely. right? Your clear focus, right? Yep. Yeah. So I want to uh, bring back to this. I think I love this uh, small diagram that you put in your book. I mentioned about empathy and compassion. So uh, would you share like what is the gist of this for a leader? Why, why a leader need to be empathy and compassion? Probably you explain a bit what is those both differences are. Yeah, empathy of compassion is where you move from a transactional leader to a transformational leader. I think that is the difference between two. Transactional leader is, okay, I pay you a salary you, and you meet your KPIs and that's it. And if you don't meet your KPIs, you're out. Mm. Yeah. I think um, an investment in people goes a long way. Even if the decision that you have to make, and this is not about being the nice guy. Yeah? I also had to fire people for various reasons. I had to manage restructuring programs, also not nice because you have to let go of even your best performance in certain cases. Yeah, they just tell you this is the percentage of your team. Uh, provide the list. Well, that's terrible. Um, but you can still be an empathetic leader in how you execute this process. So when you have to fire a person. Well, first of all, I always give people a chance. So, uh, and I want to know what are the circumstances. Imagine you have a, a great performer for the last six years and uh, the current period is not so well. Mm. I want to know what's going on first with this person. And that does not, that's not looking for excuses, but that's more like, can we fix that root cause so that that person become um, a good performer. Now, we can't fix all people's individual issues. I also had one of my top engineers in my team uh, had an alcohol problem and um, he was based in a different continent. So 
we didn't find out because of the time zone difference and the local managing director thought, oh, he's working for Dennis in odd hours, but at some point he came into the office uh, drunk uh, almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't fix his alcohol problem, but how do you deal with that? Well, I could fire him on the spot almost like that. First, I thought, hey, say, okay, you know, you have personal problems. We are willing, I spoke with HR, of course, on this, even though it was not the official policy, said we are willing to give you uh, six months uh, um, uh, time off. You can go to a rehab and you can still come back. So we won't fire you, but we will give you kind of six months mm. unpaid leave. I think that is empathy. That's the least thing I can do because he can fix his personal problem. I cannot fix his alcohol problem. I mean, you can do coaching as a leader, but mm. this is counseling, right? You can't do that for a person. And they need to sort out their personal mess first. But you can still offer this kind of thing, which is a win-win in the end. However, he refused to admit that he had a problem. He said, I don't have any alcohol problem. OK, then I said, then it stops here. Uh, I have no other choice but to uh, let you go. Uh, so that was uh, one of those decisions. I think, yeah, it's not nice, but that's then the only choice that you have because you cannot maintain that person in the team. Because if you maintain that person in the team, um, actually, you tell the rest of your team, uh, it's okay to be an alcoholic. Uh, you you yeah. give the wrong signal. Um, so empathy for me is that, yes, you take the circumstances of a person, you step in the shoe of that person, and you try to look for solutions that are beneficial for both for the company and the individual. And if there's a situation that cannot be solved or the company is worse off, uh, in the end of the day, we represent the company. right? Still then you can find an, uh, an humane uh, way out. So for other people who have to leave during restructuring, you can still offer, um, for instance, a great testimonial. Um, you can offer some HR support or uh, help with uh, job, uh, job hunting or improve the CV, that kind of thing. So one, one person I had to let go, he called me later on and he said, Actually, thank you so much, Dennis, that I have now a much better job and uh, with your help, um, yeah, I also had to, I actually, he said, I already knew that I had to uh, go. You were just there to make that final call. Now, I think that is, in a way, is a compliment that mm. um, the situation is not nice, but you can still turn it in positive. Now, a lighter example is um, other engineers in my team, you can call them on the Sunday afternoon, systems down hey, in IT, department system is down, they will uh, jump on uh, line and uh, connect to the laptop and basically they always work more than the 40 hours in the contract. So one time this guy came to me and said, um, yeah, Dennis, can I have a half day leave uh, because my brother is in hospital? Yeah. I said, half day leave? You go to the hospital uh, right now and I will not deduct anything of your, I have, that, I have that authority to do that, I don't deduct anything of your leave, you just go. Yeah. And that, that small half day that I give, I mean, I already get, get it back 10 times over because they feel like, wow, he's not taking advantage of me. When I really need to leave, he, I can get it. When I need them, they are also there for me. So mm. it's always an exchange. Mm. So always focus on the right energy, right, right energy exchanges and yeah. also cultivate uh, positiveness in, yep. in the things that you're doing. So even in the most negative situations like restructuring and firing people, you can still be empathetic. Mm. I believe that. So it is, I'm curious after reading your book and obviously the story are very interesting. And is there any stories or examples that you intentionally need to let go from the book and uh, why, what is that you have? <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, the naked leader is it's not about self-censoring, uh, because then I would um, corrupt my own uh, philosophy here, right? Uh, so initially, actually, I wanted to make it um, a book, a guide, without my own uh, experience and stories mm. in, in it. But then I think, OK, how can you be a naked leader if you, you're not naked yourself? So in that sense, I didn't leave anything out. Mm. Um, I could have written an many more pages once you're in that flow. I can add more examples, interview more people, things like that. Uh, but I also thought it's good to keep it compact and um, digestible for people. Uh, that's why I made it a trilogy, because I felt there's much more to share, but I will do that in different books. Also, because the questions that I ask here, mm. 
uh, I don't want to overwhelm the readers with even more questions. Uh, even one question can take months to find answers for people. Yeah. So why making more pages? Uh, but one example that I thought later of that would, would have been nice to include that was um, at my childhood. That really also divined my view on this empathy thing. Um, so uh, that was, um, my parents used to have, um, have a yacht and uh, every weekend we went, um, if, if the, the time allowed because of my sister, sure. uh, we went to and, um, uh, out to the lakes and then we come back. Now, there was a, and we always pulled a small uh, boat that I could sail myself, a very small boat, like three meter mm. boat. So then my dad said, okay, uh, back in the harbor, you, you put that boat uh, at, uh, let's say, the car park for the boat, right? And it was really windy, uh, almost stormy weather. And every time I put a rope on one side, the, the boat drifted off again uh, to the other side where uh, I, I didn't want it to be. So I really lost my patience. Like, I can't uh, fix the, the boat to the, uh, to the shore. And suddenly, and this is also a kind of a law of attraction where people appear in your, in your life for a reason. One man came. And he, he saw me struggling. I was a boy, like nine years, 10 years old, right? And he saw me struggling, and I was really like angry, like, I, I can't fix the boat, or I can't fix the boat. And he was so calm. His presence, he didn't say much, but his presence made me suddenly calming down. And the only thing he said to me, and he said, boy, just be calm and you can fix the boat. And that moment I could fix the boat. And what I learned from that is that is the leadership, leadership is also about being present. This person was not even telling me how to fix the boat. Yeah? He was not scolding me for not being able to fix the boat, but he was just there, he was calm. And that's all what I needed because it completely removed all the anger and patience uh, out of me as that young boy. And I only recall this whole incident because I was so young. Most of the things we forget, right, what happened in our childhood. And I recall it later. I think, well, that would have been a great example to include in the book because that's how strong a presence impacts other people. Yeah, it's not even what they say. It's just being there for a person. Yeah. I found that amazing. Yeah, so I thought that one I could have included. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 brings, yeah. it brings me to this thing that uh, we always underestimate ourselves as a human, right? Sometimes just with our present, like we say for the lack of words, say a waste, like to put a flower in a room that you are just that a static waste, uh, it could bring significantly different energy to the room and the people around you. Like just that person to be, look at his face, you feel wow, much calmer. Yeah. And it's able to help to solve the problem. And yeah. Do not underestimate your present, whether it's positive present or negative present. I think to be uh, very aware of that as well. Yeah. This. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There is, I think I would uh, go through some uh, rapid fire questions. I yep. have three for you. And then, um, and then you will go to your short uh, sh sharing of the reading of the book. Okay. If you could have a gigantic book anywhere with your favorite quotes or message, it can be a picture, it can be a quotes or whatever that can be seen to millions of people, what would that be and why? I would say the understanding that change, uh, everything is always changing. So whether it's positive or negative, I think that quote is, uh, change is continuous and you yourself are also a work in progress. So that's what I write, like being is always becoming. Mm. And if you look at it there from that perspective as a learning opportunity, then I think life becomes much smoother and interesting. Uh, so I think it will be like that, yeah. Change is continuous, being is always So like becoming. open up our hand for change and hope that the change is something that you want and something that even better than we expected. Right. Yes, you need to embrace the change. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, what is one of your best or most, most worthwhile investment that you have ever made? 
okay, it's not crypto. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my first startup. I lost all my money in that one. Um, I would say my best investment uh, was my 10 day retreat. At the moment that I was really in rock bottom and initially I thought it's an escape. I, I really would just want to get away from everyone and everything. Yeah. But I think it's my best, best investment ever because that 10 days gave me the insight for the rest of my life. Mm, okay, I will not put you. Okay, uh, since that we are at the book club, right? What are some books or books that or resources that you have found particularly influential or life changing? Um, yeah, I think leaders are readers, and readers are leaders, and uh, most of the top leaders that I admire are also avid readers. I think in, in these days with social media um, and short attention span, I think a, a, a book, a book is a, is a, is a testament of, of, of someone and there's always a lot to learn from every book in that sense. So it's hard to make that choice. Um, but the, the, the Tibetan book of living and dying, that's um, quite a profound book to me because that's also about the, the urgency of life and the understanding that life is urgent is also that gain mm. the zero regrets, uh, do the things that you really need to do, uh, knowing that your time is limited, all these things uh, also helps, is a good decision making tool. Yeah. That I think is, I read that book three times and still I don't, I think I understand only 10% of what is, I mean, it's English, I can read English, you can <laughs> read the text. But the, the, the profoundness of that book, uh, yeah, uh, it's, that's like PhD level to me. Uh, mm. yeah. would you, I think uh, I asked almost of my question that would you read some of your, like you mentioned, you want to read some of the books and see and, and, and share with the people here about the, that, will it be okay? Yeah, also to the online people, I still see people online. Thanks for hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is from the first chapter, the, the who am I part. The vast majority of people, including many leaders, avoid looking deeply into themselves. Most people live their lives on, lives on the surface and they are actually mentally in a fog state, FOG. That's not inherently wrong, but it's just incomplete. Most people are hiding a part of themselves in order to protect themselves. In this conditioned existence, we are living a life driven by unconscious needs, impulses and also limited beliefs. Mary stays in a job that she hates. Peter keeps scolding his staff for no apparent reason. Jane spends all her time chasing low value clients and her business is stagnating. And Harry is a perfectionist and puts unrealistic demands on his team. Be brutally honest to yourself. Are you truly happy right now? What is your definition of success? Are you tapping into your fullest potential or are you limiting yourself? For many leaders, there's an underlying restlessness that despite everything they have, everything they know, and everything they achieved, they still have that underlying nagging feeling. So do you recognize this? You are in a state of constant stress and stuck in the daily rat race. You do not always react the way you want to, to your team or to your kids, or your friends, or even to yourself, you bang your head on the wall. This is not in the book, but just some examples. <laughs> you get frustrated when things don't go your way. Oh yeah, we've been there before. You don't find fulfillment in what you do. You hit a ceiling in your life or in business, or there is something holding you back. The way we see ourselves in, and the world around us is a biased perception of the reality. And each of us has a flawed idea of who we are. Most of the time this is overstated or understated but rarely accurate. So how you think you respond versus how you actually respond. How you think others will see you and how others really see you. How you think the world is and how the world really is. And what you think you can achieve versus your true potential. Without self-awareness, you don't know who you really are. You don't know the impact of your behavior to others and you see the world through a contaminated lens. At best, this leads to suboptimal results for yourself, your business or your work, and everyone around you. You are living an incomplete life. At worst, this situation manifests itself as emotional outbursts, health issues, regrets, unhappiness, 
and it might even lead to depression or addictive behaviors. So are you in charge of yourself? Or are you carried away by your thoughts, emotions, and impulses? As leaders, we ought to be in charge. To develop true leadership qualities, first and foremost, you gotta be in charge of yourself. To be in charge means to be fully aware of yourself and the world around you. You need to get out of your own way. Leaders without self-awareness are ineffective because they don't see or they don't want to see that they themselves are the primary cause of their stress, frustrations, and limitations. They externalize everything to avoid looking at themselves. They don't want to look at their naked self. And the easiest way to deal with these inconvenient parts of yourself is to run away from it, getting fully absorbed in work, keeping yourself busy, seeking attention, complaining, buying things that you don't really need. All of these are temporary ways to distract yourself instead of true happiness. How you lead others is reflected in the, how you act, speak, and carry yourself. And even if you're unaware of it, others will surely pick up on this. If you're full of jealousy, anger, or stress, it can come through in subtle ways, no matter how hard you try to hide it. Therefore, the first step of self-transformation is to become aware. Aware of what? Aware of who you truly are on a deeper level. Are you ready to discover your naked self? Can you see the world as it really is? When you ask yourself surface questions, you only get surface answers. When you're ready to look deeper into yourself, you will find bigger answers, and that is liberating. Thank you. Okay. So how's the time? Yeah, I think we can get questions from the sure. online. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's one question for Dennis. Uh, you, uh, how did you handle fast growth and scale your business? How to handle fast growth and scale a business? Um, how how you handle the fast hmm. growth and scale your business? I guess that more on your own experience. Yeah, I can give an MBA answer. Uh, that is, of course, making sure that um, you deliver great services and do your marketing well. But from a personal leadership perspective, what this book is also about is that um, you need to focus. So for me, growth is focus. And what I learned from my first startup that failed was that uh, I put too many eggs, uh, eggs in the basket because I thought that is less risky. So I was working on multiple products, uh, tried to chase multiple clients in different markets. I did not have a proper network, and basically it was all diluted. So the overall idea of the business was, was solid, but uh, the way I wanted to bring the products to the market was, I, I was almost like panicking. Try this, do that. Uh, um, that doesn't work. So if you really want to scale a business, you need to be brave enough. But for me, it's not brave because if you really know what you want, uh, then that path leads you to, to that growth. Mm -hmm. And you also see that with all the, the successful business leaders, they, they don't start a conglomerate from day one. Yeah. Of course, Samsung, Yamaha are famous examples. They are in many different businesses. But it always starts with one one thing doing extremely well. Top sport people the same. There's rarely any sports person that master mm. multiple sports and even be the gold winner in it. So to scale a business for me is focus. Dennis, I think just curious my part is that when you say focus, right? For me, the natural instinct is that to be focused are pretty risky because one thing is 100%. So what is your thought? How to have the right mindset whether focus is the right thing to go to? <laughs> Yeah, and that's also uh, what I wrote in, uh, in the book for all the reasons uh, not to go for your uh, plan A uh, is because if you have a plan B to uh, Z, that means insecurity. And if you have too many backup plans, uh, that means you lack confidence in plan A, uh, but you also lack the focus. So I'm not saying that everybody should quit their job uh, if you don't have savings and you have a mortgage to, uh, to pay. Uh, that is... That's more like gambling, right? That's, yeah. that's, that is reckless. But a calculated risk for me is if, if you really find what you wanna do, um, and of course there's, there's a need for it in the market, these two things come together, 
then you need to have that courage to so you know that that is the thing you want to do. If it doesn't work out, you can do a, a serial entrepreneurship in that sense. You can always work, work out different ways to, to get to your purpose. Uh, but it's, it's about the courage and confidence that plan A will work out. You need to work on that, finding that plan A first. Well, before you can make a plan, you need to know what you want to do mm. and who you are. I Okay, it, it has sparked me in my mind. Is that I remember in the book you mentioned about if plan B look attractive, <laughs> plan A might not work. Yeah. So what is your mind when you write, write that? Yeah, well, I, um, some of the leaders that I coach, they, they are still in a corporate job and they're thinking of starting a business. And it's good to plan, plan your business already and not just uh, quit overnight. Uh, but they, yeah, yeah well, one day I'm, I'm going to launch this business and uh, then another year pass and another year pass. And then, of course, it's also the time. If you're in a full-time job, you want to build a business, forget about it. it. You need a lot more time to build a business than just by the way. But uh, by the way will not bring you to success. Yeah. So at some point, you need to make that jump. Mm. And jump into the pool and be confident that you can swim. And maybe the, that swimming will not go easily in the beginning. But if you never jump into the pool, you will never learn swimming. I think I need to go back to the first stage to meditate first, <laughs> making sure I'm, I increase the gain of uh, jumping the pool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is also you need to you need to find out that you really want to swim. Um, I'm also a marathon runner, for instance. I, I don't like cycling, even though I'm from the Netherlands, which is a country with a lot of bicycles. I don't like cycling at all. So if you ask me to go on any, uh, for, compete in any race for cycling, the fact that I'm not passionate about it yeah. makes it a lot harder. So people who start a business just, oh, I want to make big money. Well, money is a result of something. If you start a business just to make money, um, how can you persevere in all these challenges, not giving up? because the money will not come in the first year uh, most of the times. So that, that insight and the knowledge of what, what you truly want, the end goal, the way you get there can, can change. Yeah. Uh, but the end goal is, is, is important to find that out. Yeah. So open up uh, any question in the room? Yeah. Yeah, the, yes. uh, can you go to the microphone? The, 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 the. <laughs> Hi, Dennis. Thanks for the sharing. I would like... Uh, have your comment on the topic of comfort zone because I always think that um, people would perceive comfort zone as uh, maybe not good you know, or maybe that there could be a biased perception but I think there are kind of two aspects of comfort zone I think there's your regular not so good comfort zone meaning that you're lazy or you stick to a certain habit where you're not productive you're not having a lot of growth uh, typical examples are watching Netflix and, and, and at home and all that. But there's also the other aspect of comfort zone is what if you are a consistent performer? You come to office, you drive people, you drive programs to good KPIs and all that. But imagine, but try to imagine that person, uh, that person is also in a comfort zone. Because even though he does things that people perceive as difficult, why? Because you need to drive programs, you need to satisfy stakeholders and all that. But yet again, that person is in his or her comfort zone. So do you, do you have any comment on, on this angle? You know? Yeah, that, that is a very great question. And spot on is that there are two, two sides of comfort zone. Because if everything is uncertain in, in your life or even in the world, it's also harder to um, manage your fear. Um, so, starting a business, moving to, to a country far away, all these things uh, give a lot of fear and uncertainty. You really step into the unknown, so that's really taking you out of the comfort. So, what you need to look for, both personally, but I think also in business, get, get to that in a, in a minute, is that, that island of familiarity. And what I mean with an island of familiarity, and in HR world, it's also a very fashionable term now, is psychological safety. Yeah, so if, if, if the team is driven by fear, you will not get very good results. Yeah? So psychological safety is also related to that. 
So that familiarity, that means you have something to rely on or something that has not changed or will not change that gives you, even if your island is really small, hey, you, you, you only start on one square meter uh, or the circle is one meter. At least you have something to stand on and not uh, swimming in the open ocean. You, you need something to, uh, in your life uh, to be able to uh, deal with challenges. Now, for me, is that, for instance, uh, my, um, um, my music. Yeah, in, in, the, in the worst moments in my life, I always had some certain melodies or some uh, music in my head. And I think, um, and my favorite uh, rock songs and bands, well, even if they take away uh, Spotify uh, or whatsoever, but that, that, that music is a part of me. But that is my, my island of stability. I think uh, that's one thing. So it's not even my friends or my wife or my parents, because eventually, uh, we don't know what happened uh, tomorrow. Uh, that is, can also, is also subject to uncertainty. Yeah. So I, I lost my uh, a job unexpectedly. Um, my marriage failed. So the things that we think is permanent are, in the end, not so permanent. So that island of stability is also a risk if you choose the wrong islands of stability, because almost everything can change. Yeah. So what is that for you? That is your safety net. Same goes for companies. Uh, so also companies have this false belief, yes, we need to be innovative and nobody should be in the comfort zone and we need to uh, challenge ourselves and things like that, not to become blind like Kodak and Nokia did. Yes and no. Um, Compare it to a football team. You have the, the midfielders. Yeah? Not everybody is the attacker. You have the average performers in, in, in your team. They are all very needed. Yeah? If the average performance is usually uh, 60 or 70% of the team is they meet the expectation. Nothing wrong with that. Not everybody can be the top performer or the one who was always scoring all the goals being the David Beckham in the team. David Beckham alone cannot win the game. Mm. Yeah. So in that sense, if you say comfort zone or stability, I think is not, in, in, not inherently wrong. Um, mm. Also where I, say, I said before, like safety environments, um, SOPs must be in place. Uh, that cannot be innovative or uncertain. Yeah, you want to have a predictable uh, SOP for pilots, yeah? not just randomly. Uh, had a pilot just drank uh, two bottles of wine and uh, it will go into the air. Luckily, there's an SOP preventing us from, from these kind of disasters. So yes, the, the problem with most companies is that they are not really aware of uh, which island, uh, what is the boundaries of your island. And the island becomes too big, and that is complacency. So, what we need to do for ourselves and for the organization is, OK, what are the things that must be stable in order to run our business? And what are the things, how do we embrace uncertainty in all the other aspects? And can we be very innovative in it? And I think the, the smaller the island is, the more agile you become as an organization. Yeah? I think to be comfort, what you said, to be comfort is not an enemy, but how we perceive that and making sure that it helps in the overall yep. oral goal. Right? Absolutely. So I think we obviously need to be stable, like be comfortable so that we can grow. But I think there's a multiple aspect of it to make it a positive things. Right. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We, so the false belief of things that are comfortable with in the end are not comfortable. Correct. That is the problem. Yeah. So I think uh, before we end, I also wanted to share this thing is that uh, it has been some time me and my committee member, uh, we are thinking about to continue a networking opportunity for everyone. So that's why we also created a LinkedIn community. So the purpose of that LinkedIn community is to, uh, because we felt that what we are doing here are more like one way we share to you, over, especially those that is online. Uh, we also want to see how can we be more interactive and have opportunity to network and get connected to people like-minded and also for you to share things that you have learned and also for you to share uh, some opportunity of what we have right here to, to us and that's why if you would rest it to you uh, I will send out the link how you join the LinkedIn community later Thank you for joining the 1010 podcast I hope that you enjoy yourself today learn something new do join us at the LinkedIn community and finally be a little bit kinder to the people around you and also to yourself. Until next time, I will see you and 
Happy Learning， 拜拜。